Elk's Book Convocation Series this morning, he's very happy to present to us the Honorable Tran Von Din, who is currently Washington Bureau Chief for the Saigon Post. Our speaker this morning has quite an interesting and varied background. He has served as guerrilla fighter against the Japanese and the French. He was Brigadier General and Chief of Staff with the Laos Viet Liberation Armies in Vientiane between 1945 and 1947. He became a journalist in 1948 and in 1951 was press attaché for the Vietnamese Embassy in Bangkok. Between 1957 and 1960, he was named Vietnamese Consul General and Minister to Burma. During the years that he served in this post, he was also observer at the United Nations, observer at CETO meetings in New Zealand, and went on observation and study tours in Latin America, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Israel. In 1960, he was appointed to the cabinet post of Director General of Information of the Republic of Vietnam. In 1961, he joined the Vietnamese mission in the United Nations and was named consular in his nation's embassy in Washington, D.C. 1963, a very crucial year for Vietnam, he served as acting Vietnamese ambassador to the United States. Mr. Von Dien is author of a recently published book, No Passenger on the River, dealing with American and Vietnamese relations. I am very pleased to present to you Mr. Van Dien, whose subject this morning will be the war in Vietnam. Please to welcome. I'm very fortunate to be the only man left in Washington, D.C. who knows something about Vietnam today. <laughs> Everybody was away. So you see, the fact that the United States government has concentrated on the effort of the problem of Vietnam means to me one thing. That the situation in Vietnam has reached a, a stage when a solution could be and must be found. In order to find the solutions, we have to know why did it happen. Probably, I never seen in the history of any country, especially in the history of the United States, a war which had created so much confusion in the mind of people like the war in Vietnam. Actually, I think the war in Vietnam is a very confusing one. But to me, it's a very clear one, because I look at it as a Vietnamese and not as Americans. The war in Vietnam actually start not today or yesterday or two years ago, but actually in 1940s. You know, 1940 was a year when the Japanese came and occupied Vietnam. It was the beginning of the war in Vietnam. During that period, Vietnam was under the French colony. So the Vietnamese had two kinds of colonial powers, the French and the Japanese. That is why most of the Vietnamese, and I'm proud to say I was one of them, who fought against both the Japanese and the, Viet uh, and the French. During that period, all of us in Vietnam, even the communist minority there, look at the United States of America as a country which will, after the war, save Vietnam from both the Japanese and the French. And as you know, President Roosevelt has repeated many times that all the colonies should be free. And yet, in 1945, when the Japanese was defeated, we did not see any American in Vietnam. I saw only once, but one is a journalist, and the author, I think, this was a tourist. So the Vietnamese at that time was really very disappointed because after fighting so hard, and I think many of the Vietnamese are members of the 
Office of the Strategic Service, which is American outfit in South China to fight against the Japanese, but dealing mainly with the intelligence business. Now it's become a CIA, as you know. So I think after this, I think many of the Vietnamese are very disappointed because instead of seeing the Americans, we saw the French. And worse than that, we saw even the, Jap the Chinese, which is one of our traditional and enemies. So we have really no choice except to fight again. That is why the first quoted Indo-Chinese war took place in 1946. And the party which directed that war was the Viet Minh Party, and the head of that party is now the president of North Vietnam, Mr. Ho Chi Minh. So during this war against the French, again, you see, we hope that the United States will take a position to help us. Believe me, in this new year, I'm not coming here to tell that how wrong we could be, but I think it's good for us to know the past in order to bring some constructive conclusion for the future. So I think we really hope that last time that somehow the United States as a Pacific power intervene in the war for a settlement between the French and the Vietnamese. But a strange thing happened. In 1950, the United States decided to hand the French against us. You might know or might not know that in 1953, the volume of American aid to the French was 700 million a year. So you see, this is not to blame anybody. Politics is, I have been in politics for some years, and I think one of the requirements of being a good politician is to be completely blind. <laughs> so you see, this, is, this thing happened. So 1954, when the French was defeated by the Viet Minh, the country was divided into two parts. Here come the most famous $25,000 question. What about the Geneva Agreement? Everybody said that we respect the Geneva Agreement. The United States said we respect the Geneva Agreement. The North Vietnamese said we respect the Geneva Agreement. The British said so, the Russian said so, the Viet Cong said so. But what are actually the ascension of the Geneva Agreement which divided Vietnam in 1954 at the 17th parallel? The question most discussed about the Geneva Agreement is the partition of Vietnam at the 17th parallel. I think that partition is not permanent. Actually quoted, the partition is for military purpose and it must be temporary. That is why the 17th parallel was called the temporary military demarcation line. It was not and it could not be a political line. That is why theoretically Vietnam, even in 1954, was a one country. That is if we understand this point and then the whole thing will be easier for us. But in 1956, which is a year we should have elections for the unification of Vietnam according to the Geneva Agreement, we did not have the elections. Here I'm not going to blame anybody for that, but this is reality. That in 1956, there is no election to unify Vietnam. From 1956 onwards, it's obvious to me that something is about to happen. And I would be very surprised that the North Vietnamese should not intervene in South Vietnam. And here again, is another controversy. According to our reasoning, it means the South Vietnamese government and many people in this country, there was a clear case of aggression of the North against the South. Here I leave you to your judgment because you are all college students, you read books, what do we mean by aggression? To me, aggression is the sending of armed forces from one defined country to another country. That is what I call aggression. Of course, there are many ways for 
doing this kind of thing. But this is the theoretical definition. When you have two separate countries go sending the army to each other, and then you have a case of aggression. But if you look back at the Geneva Agreement, there was never been two Vietnam. So the case of aggression is to me a very debatable question. Nevertheless, in 1956, when the Geneva Agreement did not materialize in the elections, I believe that the North Vietnamese should try to do something in the South for the unification of the country. And that is why we may say, in our own concept, that is aggression that the Vietnamese send in the political commissar, the cadres, and all these people to help the South Vietnamese front of liberation. But it's only in December 1960 that what we call now the Viet Cong was formed. It was the front of liberation for the South. And here is again is something which amazed me. You see, every time you read the newspaper in this country, even the New York Times, and especially the New York Times, I guess, you said the Viet Cong political arm at the front of liberation of the South, political arm of the Viet Cong. It's, to me, it's very strange. What does it mean, actually? This is why, you see, you need to go to college to make these things important. When people read it, we must ask ourselves, what does it mean? To me, it means nothing. Why is the we call the front of liberation of the South a political arm of the Viet Cong? So translated, it means like this. The front of liberation of the South is a political arm of the Vietnamese communists. What does it mean? Uh, can you say that the... Uh, uh, now let me think of an example. The, uh, the American for Democratic Action is a political arm of the Democratic Party, or something like that, you see. I think it's very strange, because then we confuse one very big important issue. We call the Front of Liberation, the Viet Cong, it means Vietnamese communist. Because why? Somewhere, somehow, there are people who think that in order to fight anywhere, we must call somebody a communist. And this is actually the beginning of many erroneous thinking. Because I can even today, you see, I cannot see why nobody question this sentence, the front of liberation of the South, Polygon arm of the Viet Cong, because they never call themselves the Viet Cong. So why don't we call this a front of liberation for the South quoted, if you like? So this is actually behind this thinking is to convert the war in Vietnam into a war between communists and anti-communists. It's all right. Somebody may be communist, somebody might not be communist. But look at the problem with Vietnam. Is that really a problem of communism and democracy? If really in Eastern Europe, yes. In Berlin, yes. In Germany, yes. There is a clear-cut war between the communists, and the free men. But look at the undeveloped country. Do you really believe that the government in many undeveloped countries is a democratic government? I don't. And do you believe that the man who is now fighting against us with practically no shirt and, and underfed know anything about Marxism or communism? I don't think so either. So the problem is again a problem of many wars in Vietnam. So the war in Vietnam is not necessarily a war between democracy and communism because both sides don't understand anything about that. But it's a war first for the independence of Vietnam. And this kind of war the Vietnamese has been fighting for a long, long time against the Chinese, against the Japanese, against the French. So this is the first, the war for independence of Vietnam. Second is a war for unity of the Vietnamese people. And third is a war for peace and economic and social development. So if we want to solve all this problem, we have to start right from there. How to make Vietnam an independent state, how to make Vietnam a united state, and how to make Vietnam a socially coherent and economically prosperous state. And when you have these three ingredients, 
which is missing somewhere. You remember the buffering advertising in the television here. So if you have three ingredients, which is missing now in Vietnam, we have the situation in hell. That is why during this campaign of peace, which is staged in a brilliant manner by your president and the vice president, again, something is missing. Who is going to negotiate with whom anyway? We have the impression when they read the newspaper here, even the Minneapolis Tribune, that the United States are going to negotiate. I don't think so. Theoretically and legally, the United States is not at war in Vietnam. No. We are there as a guest of the Vietnamese government. We are there as advisor quoted. Although I think I never seen an advisor which has suffered so many casualties and which has fought in so well. But nevertheless, you see, this is a very strange situation. Even when we talk about negotiation, we really do not think in the practical terms. Suppose tomorrow, I give you a theoretical situation. Suppose tomorrow, Mr. Ho Chi Minh in the North, or Mr. Mao Zedong, or whoever in, in the communist side said that, Mr. President Johnson, I, I remember that once or even twice, you said that you are going to go anywhere, any place to talk to anybody. So why don't you go to Hanoi and talk with me? Do you think that the president of Guantanamo should go there? Certainly not. Because the United States is not at war with any government in, in North Vietnam or any government in, in the world today, I guess. So I think even in the problem of negotiation, we have not yet prepared the ground for negotiation. Negotiation is a very simple word, but extremely difficult to materialize it. I have been a diplomatic service and I was in the Geneva conference too. It's very difficult. So I give you another theoretical situation to think. Suppose tomorrow we have a negotiation somewhere, somehow, Minneapolis or in New York. And suppose a North Vietnamese delegation or a Viet Cong delegation said to Mr. Harriman, who probably represent the United States at that time, why you are there? Have you declared war on North Vietnam or why? You see, he cannot answer. That is why the whole secret and the whole problem of negotiation today is this. We insist to negotiate with the North Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese insist to negotiate with Americans. But when the Americans negotiate with the North Vietnamese and what happened to the government in the South, on which we have spent 16 million a day to defend. Collapse. Because who is going to trust that government, which does not even have the situation of war and peace of his own country in his hand? So this is actually the problem you all have to think. In terms of negotiation, who is going to negotiate with whom? That is why the communists always insist that you negotiate with me, it means the United States negotiate with Hanoi and the Front of Liberation for the South. And the, the United States said, we are not going to negotiate with the Front of Liberation for the South, we are negotiating with Hanoi. I think both positions are unaccept could not be accepted. That is why, from now on, we have to prepare the ground for negotiation. How to do that? One is very useful to use jet planes to do all these kind of things. But I think what the President of the United States is doing right now is only to create a climate in the world. And I think your Vice President has been doing it in the Far East too. Is to create a climate in which we gradually convince the world that they are the bad guy, we are the good guy. This is actually a cycle in warfare rather than a diplomatic warfare. But when it's come to a diplomatic warfare, more things could be done. This is why I come today for a few proposals. I'm not always critical, and believe me, I, I think that anyone who criticizes something is bound 
by his intellectual duty to propose some alternative. Criticism without alternative is unacademic and unintellectual. So I think my proposal is this. First, we have now to normalize or regularize our situation in South Vietnam. And this is the central question because many people ask all the time, even there's uh, almost 200,000 Americans who are dying, in, who are fighting in Vietnam today, still there are many people who said, why are we there? So I think this is a very important problem, how to formalize and regularize our situation in South Vietnam. Now, the argument is this. We are there at invitation of the South Vietnamese government. But which one? Second, we are in there at invitation of the Vietnamese people. Through which channels? So you see, this is our very strange situation. Of course, I know the intention, I know the bravery of the American soldiers, I talk to many of them. They are really the people we should all respect because they have done a job in extremely difficult condition. They have fought in a completely different kind of war. But nevertheless, I think we have to think in terms of how to normalize the situation. That is why I propose that in the next few days, if possible in the next few hours, we negotiate, we mean the United States of America, negotiate a treaty with South Vietnam for the stationment of American troops. Suppose now in Vietnam today, an American soldiers fought against a Vietnamese student in the street over a girlfriend or something like that. Who is going to try the American? Who is going to try the Vietnamese? Nobody knows. So I think this is a very important thing. We normalize the relation between our two countries by a treaty. And that treaty must be submitted to a referendum in Vietnam and to the Congress of the United States of America. This is very important. Otherwise, how he could say that we are there at invitation of the Vietnamese people? Because if you go to the countryside, the Vietnamese people by majority are the Viet Cong. Uh, so we cannot say that we are invited there by the Viet Cong anyway. So you see, this is actually the, I don't know why it has been forgotten for such a long time. Because when we negotiate a treaty, and then there's many other things coming up, say that we have a base now in Turan, in Danan, we have the base in Kamran, we have the base in, in uh, Tonshanyet, in the airport, we have the base in Saigon, for example. So out of this base, which is there, out of agreement with the Vietnamese government, we can negotiate. We can negotiate from nothing. For example, uh, we are now been in a very big base in Cambran, but have you seen any paper which sanctify this kind of uh, base? Not at all. And still, we said that we respect the Geneva Agreement, which forbid all the military uh, base in any country. So I think this is very important to formalize our relation through a treaty which is submitted to the Vietnamese referendum, submitted to the Congress of the United States of America. So when we have it, we have the legal power to negotiate. Because after all, when the Viet Cong said that you have no business here, no, we have business here. Because we have a treaty according to which we have the right to station in several places. And if we want to negotiate, we negotiate from there. That is why I think now we have a Thanks to the American commitment in Vietnam in the last six or seven months, or even actually a year since February 1965, we have created a very good condition for any peaceful negotiation in the future, that is a military stalemate. Everybody knows that the American strength in Vietnam could not be defeated militarily. And this is a very good thing, because this is made out of the sacrifice of many people, and we have reached it. So we have now to normalize this kind of military statement by the treaty I suggest. Second, recently many people talk about negotiation, but suppose now the South Vietnamese refuse the negotiation, which they have already said it openly, with very good reason. 
That is why we have now to think in terms of a more representative Vietnamese government. The Vietnamese government today is ruled by the people who shoot their way through the government. They are the military men, they have the men who have all the guns they need, and they are there. So I would be very happy if the United States prepare diplomatic ground for the Vietnamese to have an elected government and a civilian one. Without that, what happened when after the war you leave the Vietnam, the Vietnamese people? If the Vietnamese people at that time still have to live under the same condition, and then the Viet Cong will bloom again, and two or three years later you have to go back and fight again. So I think these two things are extremely important. And by now you must know that I'm not a pessimist. On the contrary, I'm very optimistic about the future of our countries. I'm optimistic because the war in Vietnam has brought to all of us a very good lesson. Unless the first lesson is least, in any situation, you, me, the citizen, should not say that I don't care. The war in Vietnam has been there for how many years? And only today that you invite me to speak here. It's too late. Frankly, I, I appreciate your idea, but you should have done it in 1956 or 57. This is a very good lesson for all of us, that we should care about what happened everywhere in the world. To care is not to read only the newspaper, but to find all the time as a citizen an alternative, a constructive idea, right? Talk to your congressman, to your senator, and you are fortunate to have a vice president there. Talk to him and ask him questions and, and make him work, you see. We have left all this problem for many years, and I can tell you a very strange experience I have in this country. In 1957, I was at the United Nations. And I try, you know, at that time I know the situation is very serious and sooner or later the United States is going to escalate the war and then there will be many casualties. So I asked to speak in two universities. In one university we had at that time 25,000 students. You know how many people came to listen? Two. So you see, this is the very, very first lesson. In every situation which happened anywhere, not only you as American, me as a Vietnamese, but all of us have to think about it and get ourselves involved. First, intellectually, and second, if possible, constructively and politically. This is the first lesson. That's why I'm optimist. That's why I have seen many students today here. The second lesson is this. The world today is not torn between the idea of orthodox democracy or orthodox communism. But this is a conflict between the have and the have not. In every sense of the word, in material sense, educational sense, country sense, and in every sense, this is the war between the have and the have not. And no matter whether you like it or not, look in at least room, you are the have. So that is why recently, and I strongly advise you to read an article written by the Chinese Communist Minister of Defense, Finn Marshall Lin Pao. And his article is reprinted, not uh, in the whole, but uh, I think the main line of his article has been reprinted in the New York Times on the 2nd of September 1965. So read that article by the Chinese Communist Minister of Defense, Marshall Lin Pao. He's the one who is also the Vice Premier of China, and he is a member of the Polygon Bureau of the Chinese Communist Party. And this is what he said roughly. He said that the world today is divided in two groups of nations. The developed nations, like a United States of America, Western Europe, and he called those developed nations the cities of the world. And he said that three quarters of the world belong to what he called the undeveloped countries like Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And he called this country the countryside of the world. And according to the Chinese experience in their own revolutions 
according to the lesson we have learned recently and in the last 20 years in Vietnam, soon or late, the countryside will surround the city, and the city will be strengthened to death. That is the Chinese philosophy of war and peace. In another word, the Chinese believe that if the communists and if the Chinese succeed to make the three quarters of the world, which incidentally is starving today when we are all prosperous here, to make these people revolt against the city of the world, the city of the world would be in very bad shape. We may say that the Chinese are arrogant. We may say that the Chinese are talking nonsense. But I, I believe that the same thing has been said when Hitler brought his men come. We said that that man is saying nonsense. And we paid a very dear price for that nonsense, especially the Jewish people. So you see, here we face the situation. When the Chinese believe in the new revolution in the world, in which the Chinese hope to lead the have-nots against the have, through this system of the countryside and the city. I would not say that this theory is 100% true, or 100% could be verified 100%, but only could say this. You go to any place in the world, in any underblock country, you live in a city for a few days, like a Saigon with two million people, the best nightclub you could find anywhere, the best mother car, the breasted women, the most elegant women I have ever seen in any place. But you walk out of Saigon for five miles or ten miles. What do you see there? You see, of course, now the fighting. But you see basically poverty, ignorance, oppression, superstition, everything else. And this is actually the countryside and the city. So you see, that is why the Viet Cong grow. When the Viet Cong come to these people, this means the Vietnamese Communist Asian come to these people and tell them, you see the difference between five miles from here and yourself? Of course there's a difference. The people own, your same people, your own government, they sleep on wealth and riches in the city, and you live in suffering, misery in the countryside. And the peasant said, yes, I realize that I'm very poor, and the people who live in the city are very rich. So the communist agent said, you know how to solve this problem? Fight. So the communists begin the organization, unit by unit, cell by cell. So these people are not organized as a communist, but as exactly the one who believe that he has nothing to lose, that he has nothing at all, so he must fight against the have in order to have something. This is the original idea. That is why I said earlier that the problem is not communism and democracy, but problem of have and have not. The next step, the communist agent would say to the people that you know why your government is rich, why they are corrupted, why they have so many motor cars. The patient probably said one, we don't know. He said, very simple. Last year, the government of your own government received 600 million from the United States. This is the final objective of the communists, to make an American the enemy of the people. And it's very sad now that I'm paying tax, even more than some of you here. I realize how sad it is. We try to help people. We try to build nations. And at the same time, there are people who want to fight against us. And this is why if I were American, I know the frustration. But the problem is this. We have been trying to do things which is outside the context of many countries. We, we try to believe that if you have few PhD from Harvard in the government, you could have a democratic government in that particular country. You believe that if you have me a prime minister in Vietnam, I'll be the greatest friend of the United States, and probably the next time I'll be brought out of power. So you see, all this is that in our zeal for the democratization, or I must say, for the transformation of the world, we did not actually 
when I say we, I mean mostly the Vietnamese intellectuals, the Vietnamese government. We forgot that the real element in the whole situation is not the intellectual, but the Vietnamese peasant, the one who make the majority of the Vietnamese people today. So that is why the communist theory is very clear to me. They always said, and they repeat it, but we forget it. They said that the guerrilla soldiers live with the people as a fish to the water. How we never could really look for how many fish we have in the pond, but we always know what kind of water is there. This is why the war in Vietnam is one of the very frustrating war because most of the time you don't even know the enemies. The Viet Cong is dressed like a peasant, the peasant becomes the Viet Cong. And when the communists reach a certain amount of political organization, of course, they bring in terrorist method and people are completely paralyzed and completely frightened and then we have no way to do with this thing except to bring in military troops, we bring in planes and tanks and weapons. And the more we do that, the more we create confusion among the people. I'm very sure that the Vietnamese pilot and American pilot today try very hard to avoid the civilian. But how? Vietnam is 80% jungles. How you could really know what is going under? So it's bound to make mistakes. I don't blame them. Like even yesterday, there's a group of Marines who burned a village without knowing that. I don't blame the Marines, because how we could make the difference? So the problem is, who could make that difference for us? Not Shenzhen Westmoreland, not me, not the Prime Minister of Vietnam, but only the fish know the water. So if the Vietnamese peasant believe that we are working for them, that we have their concern in our heart, that we are their friends, and then they are going to tell us who are the fishes. But unless and until that time, the war in Vietnam remains very frustrating, very elusive, and probably very inconclusive. You have a typical example in the Philippines. In Philippines in 1950s, the hooks, the communist player, was almost five miles from the city of Manila. And he did win the war in the Philippines against the communists without any single American battalion. Why it happened? Because in the Philippines, you have two ingredients which is now missing in Vietnam. First, you have a leadership in the man who really is part of his own people, who has Mr. Max Seyse, the lay president of the Philippines, who I think could be elected mayor of New York if he wants. So you see, you have that man who have generated a sense of participation and belonging with his own people, which no Vietnamese leader in the last few years have succeeded to do that. Second, in the, in the Philippines, and you know I'm the one who fought all the time against colonialism, but I must confess that in the Philippines, before 1945, the United States has laid a ground for a structural democracy, of democracy in the sense of sane government, civil service, justice, law, and listed. So when you have a situation like that, you have victory. In Vietnam, I admired a lot of French culture. Actually, I speak French better than English. And I'm basically a French existentialist. So I believe that the French has done a remarkable job in Vietnam country. But when the French left us, there's no system of justice and no civil service. So how do you expect that we could win? That is why, you see, People who blame the United States for the failure, people who blame, it's all wrong. We have to look in the roots of the problem and create this problem in order to win. We cannot win out of fresh air and pure water. We have to win or negotiate out of something. That's why the example in the Philippines is a very good example for us. That is why when President Maxese died, President Macapagan succeeded and then now President Marcos. But recently, when I passed through the Philippines, 
And after a few years of Makan Pagan regime, which is not very efficient, a lot of correction going on, the hoax problem in the Philippines is very much increasing. And if we, the President Marcos in the Philippines is no, not going to stop the corruption and all this kind of social injustice, soon or late, we probably have a Vietnam in the Philippines. That is why, you see, I agree, and I never say that the people who are anti-communist is wrong, but there is communism and communism. The problem of communism in the undeveloped country should be understood against the background of undeveloped country. It should not be understood against the background of a developed country. So the only deterrent and the only way to deal with this problem is first that we must affirm, and you will be surprised when I was in the army, which I actually fighting against a friend, you will be surprised at how many people are pro-American in their heart. You would be very surprised. But we never really, because of politics and our involvement in other areas, we never been able actually to affirm our fierce determination for decent government and for the rights of men everywhere. You see, this is one of I should not say failure, but for example, in 1950 in Vietnam, when the United States had the friend, I know because I'm study public and side, you have to do that in order to please the French because the French are part and the key factor to the NATO at that time, and your concern at that time is Europe. That is why I think the problem in the United States, in my opinion, in concerning the problem of Vietnam and elsewhere, is that. After the Second World War, the United States became both the Pacific and Atlantic powers. As such, I really think that you have to take, to think of all the problem in the world. I think the President Johnson, probably which who spent today 70 or 75 percent of his time for foreign affairs. And unless you two take the same kind of concern, how he could succeed? I'm not here to defend President Johnson. I'm not a Democrat in the state, I mean. So, you see, we have now to make a concert effort first for understanding. This is very important because you cannot solve the problem without understanding the problem. And second, we must be very, very optimistic. This morning, I think if, or yes, yes, this morning I read in the newspaper here, Larry Print an article by Mr. James Reston, which was published yesterday in the New York Times, is called Undue Pessimism. It's a very good article in the sense that in the United States, and based on our background and our economic system, we always think that there must be a solution to every problem in the world. We must fix things. We must solve things. We must, uh, you know, if we put 35 cents in a vending machine, you pull down, there must be something there. If there's nothing, they must be wrong. So you see, this is a remarkable thing in the United States. And that is why we are increasingly nervous. Why nothing happened in the world? Why nobody just have a supermarket or credit card? Why? Because first, they don't think it's very important to begin with. Second, they do not reach the status you are today in order to justify all these things. So I think you have to be optimistic. I think I would be very unhappy if I know after my address some of you said, well, why is so difficult in the world? This was is very beautiful in my view. In the next 10 years, you can go everywhere. You can look at everything, 10 star, all these kind of things. But this world is still made of human being with their own weakness, strength, beauty, and ugliness. So we have to face them all. An African, a Vietnamese, an American, all of us have the same essence as a human being. That is why I think during the last few years in dealing with the Vietnamese problem, I should say this in recapitulation. If we know the problem as such, we should have solved the problem in Vietnam in, say, in 1958, not by 200,000 American troops but with about a 1,000 American Peace Corps volunteers 
plus 100,000 Vietnamese Peace Corps volunteers. And we should not have the situation like today. Again, it's not to blame, but this is again a lesson. And today, and it's very strange that no newspaper in this country devote enough time to that conference now, which is taking place in Cuba. In Cuba today, Mr. Castro has asked a hundred member representative from the Communist Party in all undeveloped countries to meet in La Havana. And yesterday, they came out with a statement that only by racial war that they could solve the problem. So I guess that probably in the next few months or the next few years, the communists are trying to create the same kind of Vietnam in Latin America. So it's one, I think it's asking too much for all of you to think of Vietnam, to think of Latin America, to think of Alaska, and to think of paying your credit card. But what, what else could we do? We have reached a situation in the world where either we live together, survive together, or probably cease to survive together. But if you are, you read history, you have seen many situations like this in the history of mankind. But when a situation happened like this, there are many people who refuse to see things in the way we should see. There are the people who ref want to see things the way they are. And here I can repeat the famous speech by George Bernard Shaw. And he said that there are the people who see things as they are and they ask why. And this is what we are trying to do this morning. We ask why. But you should not see things as they are and as why. You are different. You are even better than me. You should dream of things which never were and ask why not. And this is you. That's why you go to school. Now I'm old, I'm 43 years old, so I see things as they are and I come here to tell you why. But you, the young generation, you should dream of things that never were. And you should ask, why not? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now, let's reason together. You can ask me any question, and you know, I can tell you very frankly that I do not have all the answer, I do not know all the truth, I'm not here a representative of nobody's, but you can find in me a Vietnamese who is very much concerned